So uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Um, I'm presenting this evening and I'm Michael Trau, but I will introduce myself a little bit later on in the presentation. A few things before we uh, go to the interesting topic of uh, tinnitus. Um, in a few days after this lecture, you will receive a link with the uh, recordings of today webinar so you can look back to it and of course nice for the people that are not able to join now to different reasons to look back to this um if for some reason you have audio problems uh, the best way is to log out and come back in and see if it's solved by this uh, uh, movement otherwise type your question in the um, question box and maybe jan uh, dommerholt can uh, can help you and if you have any questions or comments, uh, please leave them also in the question box. At the end of the presentation, I will take time to uh, try to answer all the interesting questions for us. This is a series of uh, webinars, and um, it's very nice that we are invited to, uh, to join. Crafta is uh, joining for the third time now. The first one was by Marissa, the second one by Harry from Picards, and tonight I'm doing the third one. Um, in the next coming weeks, you will see some possibilities to join the other um, interesting lectures of uh, myopane seminars. Please do so. I think it's very interesting to uh, to see them. The next one will be next Thursday, uh, Tuesday, excuse me, uh, with the title Integration of Manual Therapy and Myofacial Trigger Points by Rob Stenborough. Myopane seminars always uh, donates or ask people to donate for an, um, a specific uh, cause. And this time they have uh, chosen um, uh, Futures Without Violence. Who am I? Um, I'm Ma Michiel Trau. In English, we say Michael. And um, I will introduce myself short because it's interesting to know who is talking this evening. Um, I'm a physical therapist, manual therapist. I did my extended scope PT um, education. And I'm a crafter teacher. As physio, I work in a small specialized clinic in the Netherlands, uh, almost at the German border. And in my clinic, we work with two specialized physiotherapists, manual therapists, mainly with head, neck, and face problems. So we see a lot of people uh, with uh, dizziness, headaches, jaw dysfunctions, facial pain, and neck problems, and also with tinnitus. I uh, give education for the Crafter Organization International. I will show you in the next slides where we teach over the world. Very nice. And this is a part of my job that interests me a lot to have communication with physios, um, with uh, doctors, with uh, dentists, with speech pathologists. It's a nice way of uh, have interaction with other uh, people uh, other than the persons in my clinic. I do measure and um, help in some scientific projects, but more in the practical part of it, because I'm not a very big fan of the statistical parts that are very important, but there are other people that are very good to do that. So that's what my main function. Next to that, I'm one day in the week in a big medical hospital in the east of um, Holland in Enschede, where we have a small specialized um, group of um, extended scope physios. And we work mostly together with um, some specific doctors around specific cases. In my case, this is about tinnitus patients, uh, equilibrium, balance patients, headache, facial pain. But we have also colleagues that work specific with sport patients or with children or with oncology. I'm also a um, member of the uh, Tinnitus Academy. Academy. And this is the Dutch writing for Academy. Excuse me for that. And uh, this is a small group of specialized uh, people from different backgrounds. There's a neurologist, there's an ENT doctor, there is a yoga um, uh, professionalist, there is a psychologist, there is um, someone that does coaching. And in this Tinnitus, um, tinnitus Academy, we work with um, uh, 
persons that have severe tinnitus and looking for an um, uh, extra possibility to do something about it. And they come, for example, three days in our uh, region here in the east of Holland. And uh, we see them three days um, with different people and uh, have our goals around the difficult possibilities or the difficult um, situation with tinnitus. I will talk about this a little bit later in the lecture. So now you know who I am. Um, I know a few of you, some of, you know, of you did uh, already courses with me or we met in other um, uh, nice uh, places in the world uh, where we had uh, uh, congresses together or something like that, or education together. Um, but um, uh, the plan for tonight is to do a short introduction about Crafta so that you know what the Cranial Facial Therapy Academy is. Then we do an introduction about uh, tinnitus, models and anatomy, uh, the possibilities of an assessment in tinnitus patients and treatment, if indicated. Um, I show you this around a case of a specific patient, and then we have some time for questions and answers. I have the time limit from Jan for around one hour, so that means that we cannot be complete, and um, this will be an introduction. Uh, tinnitus is not easy, and uh, of course you understand that if we want to, um, to, to handle everything around tinnitus, we need much more time than, uh, than one hour. But it will be a nice, uh, appealing introduction, I hope, for you. So what is Crafta? Crafta is a uh, uh, craniofacial therapy academy. Um, so it's, it's there for, her for some years. Uh, it's, it's a group of, of um, uh, most physiotherapists specialized in the craniofacial region, cranial mandibular region and cranial cervical region. The specific um, uh, things of Crafta are listed in this slide. Um, we uh, walk this around very shortly. Um, we work as a therapist, but also as a coach. So we, uh, in Crafta therapy, we don't do only hands-on things. We guide the patient and we um, uh, try to be a coach around the problems of the patient and give guidelines or helpful stimulations in the direction of um, um, healthy um, healthy lifestyle um, activities, things like that. We use um, external evidence as much as possible. If we have it from the literature, it's fantastic. If we don't have it, we try to make it by doing our own scientific projects. Um, we look to the integration of modern pain me uh, mechanisms and models. It's important that we adapt to the situations we see over the world and we follow the different pain models and the uh, developments in this. So if possible, we adapt this in our system and we see how we can uh, help our physios and uh, the other people that are doing our cor courses to work with that uh, around patients. We use the skull. So sometimes we work with the cranium itself. Cranial bone techniques are involved in the Crafta education, but not from an osteopathic background of view, but from a manual therapy background. And that's a totally different one. We work a lot of times interdisciplinary. That means that we have contact with doctors, with uh, speech pathologists, with dentists, with um, orth orthodontics. Uh, these are the, the main fields that Crafta is involved in, where we have um, a combination a lot of times in communication around the patient. Pediatric patients are important for Crafta because we know that the growth and uh, dysfunctions can occur very early in life and can be one of the reasons that patients get ongoing problems later on. And we are more than a, a TMG course. And when you do a Crafta course, you are not the master of the joint. You are the master of the head. And the joint is one of the structures in that. But you will become um, an experienced therapist that can also work with muscles, with nerves, but more important, with specific um, pathologies and uh, clinical patterns that you will learn. And the joint can be a part of that. Um, other box is we look to functional and active rehabilitation. 
an active patient that understands the goals of the therapy is very, very important. We all know this in low back, in hip patients, but also in craniofacial, craniomandibular patients and tinnitus patients. It's important to use this approach. And last, but for sure not least, we are open-minded. That means that we can adapt to new things that occur, that will develop and that we can learn from each other. So a lot of times there are interesting um, um, discussions in the, in the groups when we teach. And we learn from that also. Where are we? Uh, on a lot of places. And this is Europe for the part uh, from America. This is Europe. Um, and uh, here you see the Netherlands, this part, for sure we are there. In Germany, we have a lot of places. Uh, in Czechia, we start next year. We are in Poland, in Austria, in Switzerland, um, in Italy, in France, in Spain, and in Turkey. And also in um, a little bit more to the south in Israel, but it's not on this map. And since a few years, we are in the States and in Canada. And we have a few points, Arizona, in Casper, in Wyoming, and in Appleton is this, I think, and um, Bethesda. And we have a few places in Canada where we teach. So this is an interesting um, development also for Crafta to have the combination with uh, America, North America, and Canada, and to see how uh, physiotherapy and craniomandibular region, craniofacial, is, uh, is, is go ongoing there. Okay, the topic of tonight is tinnitus. When we so see for the um, official um, reference for this, tinnitus is a conscious perception of an auditory sensation in the absence of a corresponding external stimulus. So most of the times, these patients have symptoms, and in the main group, another person cannot hear these symptoms or these specific sounds. These um, sounds can be, for example, ringing, buzzing, roaring, hissing, or humming. But some patients have these sounds through each other. So they have more sounds at the same time, or they have um, a sound that is uh, in the morning more buzzing, and in the afternoon, more hissing or humming. So these sounds are uh, possible to change over time or at the same time. They can change in the, or they can be different in the left and the right side. They can be the same, it's very central in the head. And people can have more sounds at the same time. For example, a very high uh, irritating sound and a very low um, buzzing, uh, sound more in the background at the same time. There are patients telling us that in the um, subjective examination that they have seven different sounds that they can identify from each other at the same time. This is amazing. Um, in the literature, you see an objective tinnitus and a subjective tinnitus divided. The objective one is obvious, the one that an external observer can perceive and can hear, and the subjective tinnitus is in one is the one where we cannot find the cause of the sound and the examinator cannot hear the sound. This is the big group. We see most of the patients in this group. The subjective tinnitus, where we talk now about, is a highly complex condition with a multifactorial origin and therefore heterogeneous patient profiles. It's not easy to bring these patients into boxes because um, they have different backgrounds and um, very different comorbidities. Um, if you look to that from a very recent uh, study that I will show you later in the presentation from CMIDL, we see that, um, for example, uh, frequent uh, comorbidities that we see in tinnitus patients are um, vestibular disorders or hearing disorders. Mood changes like uh, depression. It doesn't have to be a very deep depressed person, but can also be this dysthymia uh, and, and, and uh, moderate moderate uh, uh, depressive disorder. Anxiety disorders, where um, 
different anxiety profiles can play a role, but also the persons with a severe stress or adjustment disorders. Um, we know most probably the post-traumatic stress disorder as one of the common ones in this group, but can also uh, be the other um, possibilities listed in this, um, in this box. So these are frequent tinnitus comorbidities in the patient groups with the subjective tinnitus. An easy um, uh, grading system that um, uh, this group of, of doctors was postponing was um, uh, the grade, oh, excuse me, was the grade one, no distress, no impairments. The grade two, where the tinnitus is an impairment um, uh, on different levels, if possible, um, but is occasionally there and um, under stressful stimulation um, is, is more clear and maybe also when, when there's a silence around the patient, then the tinnitus is um, there for the patient. Then we have a more severe case in category three, grade three, where the tinnitus is, is regularly uh, there and uh, occurs in several uh, situations. And the four is a very severe one where the tinnitus is constant there and leads to impairment um, and occurs in almost all the situations. Um, these groups, especially the category three, two, is uh, the group that when you give them a lot of explanation and they know what's happening and they are not afraid of severe pathologies, is okay with that. Most of the times they don't need a specific therapy. The category three and four is more at risk for um, aggravation of symptoms and problems and will ask for therapy if possible. When we look to the prevalence and the etiology, we see that um, 10 to 90% um, of the adult population have some form of tinnitus. In 6%, this is a debilitating symptoms. So it's really severe, it's really hard, annoying, irritating for them. Here is a female or a male-female ratio for two to one. So male persons are more at risk. And the exact etiology is unknown. There are risk factors, however, like hearing deficits, um, head injuries, uh, middle ear pathologies, and depression. And, and now comes the interesting part, uh, there are correlations or uh, influences from the dysfunctions of the cervical spine and the temporal mandibular joint or temporal mandibular region. So to look to the anatomy, we see an outer ear canal. We see here, when we look a little bit closer, the tympathic membrane. There we see the three small hearing bones. And there we see the um, inner ear region where the nerve is, is going to the brain. Um, when we go into this a little bit detailed, the green part is called the outer ear. The red part is the middle ear where the three small bones, the, the malleus, the icus, and the stapes is uh, lo localized. And the uh, purple, part of this drawing is the inner ear. So what's happening is that normally um, air frequency changes come into the ear, sound or no, um, frequency changes. So they come mechanically to the tympathic membrane. They stimulate the tympathic membrane in a in, um, frequency change. From there, the bones make a mechanical uh, movement and bring this movement to the inner ear where the corti organ, a very small and very um, uh, detailed organ, is making from this mechanical frequency change an electrical frequency. And this electrical frequency is picked up by the nerve endings of the cochlear nerve and brought to your brain, where you can, um, where it's presented to the auditory cortex and where you can um, recognize this as a music, a tone, an angry wife or man, or whatever for sound you're expecting or hearing or recognizing. 
Yeah, interesting is the hysteric tube here. And some connections that will come a little bit later. This is in the ear. Very important to know something about it, but there's a lot of connections around the ear. When we look to this person from the left side, we see for sure the nice ear over there. When we look, go a little bit deeper, we see here the muscles surrounding the temporomandibular joint. Here you see the condyle of the temporomandibular joint and the fossa in the temporal bone. Here's the meatus acousticus, the outer ear canal. And the um, muscles around surrounding this whole area with, in yellow, the different nerves. So there is a lot of connection of um, uh, other structures around the ear that can play a role and have influence on the ear region. When we go into this a little bit deeper, and this is a very simplified uh, model of the jaw and two important or two parts of one important muscle. We see here the left jaw. Here's the joint, the condyle, the disc. There you see the fossa of the temporal bone. Here's the styloid process, of the temporal bone. And here you see an important and interesting muscle with two parts. This is the thyroid lateral muscle. The, this part, the, these two uh, parts are connected with the disc and with the anterior part of the condyle and with the sphenoid bone of the skull. If this muscle contracts, it brings the condyle a little bit more anterior and will cause a second part of the opening movement where the condyle is moving anterior. But what's happening also is when the condyle moves anterior, the disc is always also pulls anterior, there is more stress on the dorsal part of the condyle. So if you have a patient, to make this a little bit clinical, with a prognate knee, a prognate uh, lower jaw, where the lower incisors are before the upper incisors, like this man, and this is the position of this patient, you can imagine that there's a lot of pulling on the, um, on, on the jaw in anterior direction. And maybe therefore also on the retrodiscal uh, ligaments that are connected with the middle ear. So a muscle like this that contracts a lot can maybe one cause of an irritation around the ear region. Just a um, first impression of that. Here we see a drawing um, out of the book of Harry von Picard, the, the founder of Kafka, where you see the outer ear here. Here you see the ear canal, here's the middle ear region, and here's the inner ear region. Here you see, schematically, the jaw, the mandible. This is the disc. Here you see a ligament called the pinto ligament, going from the disc all the way up to one of the um, hearing bones in the middle ear. Also there, we have the stapedius muscle and the tensor tympanic muscle two important muscles that play a role in how much sound you can adapt. So if there's too much sound, very suddenly these muscles protect you. Here we see the tensor velopalatini muscle that lifts your palate when um, the oesteric tube needs to change position for cleaning the liquids out of the middle ear. So these are important functions that have a direct connection with the middle ear, or an indirect in this case. But you can imagine that if there is a contraction, a hypertonic reaction, or a forced jaw change position, sorry, a forced jaw position change, that that can have influence on the position of these bones or on the um, force that is transferred in the, into this middle ear region, and therefore have an influence on hearing maybe tinnitus, things like that. So there are correlations between the jaw region, um, muscular ligamentar functions, and the middle ear region. And we can learn that in the CASTA course we do, in the advanced courses, where we learn about the 
um, different functions of the muscles, the innovation of this, and these functions, how to objectivate that, and maybe um, treat tissue that is related with the middle ear of, or with these specific muscles. But it doesn't have to be uh, necessarily a muscle dysfunction or problem. If we look to the tympathic membrane, we see that the inner side of the tympathic membrane is innervated by the glossopharyngeal uh, nerve. And the outer side of the same tympathic membrane is innervated by three different cranial nerves. The facial, the mandibular, that is one branch of the trigeminal, and the vagal. So these three important cranial nerves have a function over the innervation of the tympathic membrane on the outside and the inside of the glossopharyngeal. So small dysfunctions in these nerves can have influences on the tinnitus or on the healthiness of the um, hearing system. Here you see a uh, very nice mandibular nerve, yeah, one branch of the trigeminal, going, of course, in the direction of your cranial mandibular system, innervating, for example, all the chewing muscles. But here's also a branch going dorsocranial, yeah, between your condyle of the jaw and the ear, uh, innervating a part around the ear, but also with a small branch to the ear itself. Yeah, here to see in the schematic proportion. Mandibular nerve, third branch of the trigeminal. Interesting of this nerve is that the trigeminal nerve has direct connections with the upper cervical nerve roots and therefore can transfer irritation, um, information, or maybe even pathology from one side to another side. Eh? So the cervical area can project pain into the trigeminal nerve and vice versa. There we have the facial nerve, yeah, of course, connected with all the facial muscles, innervating the facial muscles for your mimic um, functions, innervating your taste receptors in your tongue and some glands, very important. But this nerve is also, look back to this place, uh, connected with the, um, the tympathic membrane. And not only that, it runs very close together with the cochlear and vestibular branch of the cochlear, vestibular cochlear nerve uh, in the temporal region. So this nerve is always interesting to look for when we see patients with tinnitus problems or when we see patients with facial uh, nerve problems, we can ask for tinnitus dysfunctions or hearing dysfunctions. This is an example of a right side of the skull there's a part uh, taken away from the uh, temporal bone. Here you see the fossa of the temporal mandibular joint, where normally the head of the condyle is. And this is the um, facial canal in the temporal bone. So in your temporal bone, a little bit medial, uh, lies this facial canal where the, uh, the facial nerve has to go through. And um, you can imagine that this is very um, slow in space or uh, um, small in space and that if there is an inflammation or concussion or an irritation or an inflammation that can cause irritations on the not only facial nerve but if this runs up a little bit more medial this can also affect the hearing nerves and therefore have problems with equilibrium and with hearing function interesting to ask for if you see patients Good, some anatomy. We do a lot of more of that in the courses, of course. Tinnitus models. We can talk uh, the whole evening about this. That's not too interesting, but I will mention a few things to you to have an overview. Um, if we look to the subjective uh, tinnitus, we can divide this in the peripheral and the central ones. If we are more interested at this moment in the peripheral tinnitus, we can divide it in a conductive tinnitus, meaning that it is an outer and middle ear dysfunction, or a sensi sensory neural one, more inner ear dysfunction. 
and the inner ear problems we can divide more in um, four different boxes whereby the somatosensory tinnitus the one that we see as most effective connected with uh, manual therapy physiotherapy sitting under the um, extra sensory um, box of tinnitus so this is a model adapted from uh, Oostendorp et al in 2016 that was um, uh, specially drawn to to make clear that this is the the sort that most commonly is um, uh, is, is possible to to have influence on uh, with uh, physiotherapy or manual therapy so there was an, um, a study done in 2015 and um, the question was, uh, cervicogenic somatosensory tinnitus, is this an indication? Can we do something with that? And um, don't read everything, please. It takes too much time. But um, the, in the abstract, the authors of this study uh, were very clear that, um, that the tinnitus intensity can be changed by sensory or motor stimuli, stimuli such as muscle contractions, mechanical pressure, myofascial trigger points, but also with electrical stimulation or joint movements. So the conclusion is here that um, the influence from these structures on tinnitus is possible and that we can use it as an influence. So when we look back to the models, and um, at the end I will show you a link to the Crafta statement on tinnitus that two of my colleagues did. Um, then this is very good listed for you. There you can find a category that we call the anatomical or structural model, model whereby the sensory input can, of tinnitus can come from the craniofacial region, the outer uh, and middle ear, the craniocervical region, and the uh, temporal mandibular joint region. Um, a little bit of proof comes from this study that uh, looked to a group of um, uh, patients with uh, tinnitus. Um, the patients were um, looked after if they had a an, uh, an, an direct outer ear or middle ear dysfunction or an, an, uh, a clear severe uh, trauma or things like that. When that was not the case, they were divided in three groups um, uh, examined by a specific method, and they were divided in three groups. One group that had no tinnitus at all, uh, sorry, that had no temporal mandibular joint dysfunctions at all. One group that has pre, um, how do you call it? Um, that has um, uh, pre-symptomatic uh, temporal mandibular joint dysfunctions. So they saw some clicking and irritations and limitations, and they saw the, the third group clear TMJ dysfunctions. In all these three groups, they gave the patients, these were all tinnitus patients, yeah? in all these three groups, they gave the patients for six months uh, a splint, a night guard, um, that had an, uh, a sensitive neural um, uh, change in the patient's uh, occlusion and uh, in the position of the joint. They were supposed to wear this for six months in the night. And after these six months, they looked to every th of the three groups to the, to the results. And they saw clear differences, mainly in group two and three. So in the pre-TMJ um, group and in the TMJ group. Um, and they saw that uh, the FAS for tinnitus was changed by the uh, splint therapy, uh, significant. And uh, that's the uh, questionnaire that they used, the tinnitus handicap inventory, was also significant changed. Most in the group uh, with uh, um, temporal mandibular dysfunctions. So the conclusion of this study was that they um, saw that um, tinnitus uh, without autologic disorders and neurological diseases um, that it was wise to uh, to look for these patients in temporal mandibular joint dysfunctions to see if you can treat them. I think it's a very limited study because they looked only with a splint therapy, but it indicates that the temporal mandibular region 
can play a role on um, some forms of tinnitus. And that's a good um, um, fundament for our background where we look to not only the temporomandibular region, but also to the neck and the skull. Then there is a neurophysiological model where um, uh, the people look to the disinhibition of the dorsal cochlear nucleus by nociception of uh, capsule, muscle and nerve tissue. But also processing mechanisms can play a role here in the neurophysiological model. What is the background? Um, Levine is a uh, famous um, neurologist in this area, in this field, looked to the uh, two different forms. He called this uh, the uh, otic tinnitus or the otic pathway, where the cochlea itself was affected and changed the stimuli in the auditory nerve. Um, and therefore has an influence on the dorsal cochlear nucleus or the ventral cochlear nucleus. And the other uh, tinnitus that he um, identified was the somatic pathway, where um, head and neck, and then specific, the cranial nerves, uh, trigeminal, facial, glossopharyngeal, and uh, vagal, and the spinal, upper spinal nerves could play a role in irritating or stimulating the medullary somatosensory nucleus and thereby causing an inhibition on the dorsal cochlear nucleus. In both cases, taking care of the fact, on this case and in this case, taking care of the fact that there uh, develops a tinnitus. Um, these backgrounds of the somatic pathway are very important for us because it plays a big role in the fact that we can say as physiotherapist or, or as physio manual therapist or as dentist that we maybe have a uh, possibility to examine the patient and if we find um, recognizable dysfunctions that are connected with the problem that we can treat them yeah, so it's an important background then the third um, recognized um, tinnitus model in our uh, crafter statement after the literature is the cognit cognitive uh, affective model where central mechanisms and emotional and cognitive uh, concepts play a role. Um, this is uh, uh, one of the um, schematic um, uh, proposals how this works. Um, if the tinnitus is um, uh, so, if the tinnitus is related uh, to neural activity, there can be an, uh, an, an influence. Uh, there is a detection of the tinnitus. Uh, from there. There can be um, a misinterpretation where negative automatic thoughts occur and the patients uh, really um, are getting afraid of the of the sounds they they um, they're accepting or they may not accepting their hearing and from there there can be a distorted perception this can work on each other and stimulate more irritation more negative uh, feelings and thoughts if this leads to arousal and distress this can have a very selective attention so that you have more attention on the distress, on the tinnitus that you hear and um, thereby um, uh, putting a magnifier over the tinnitus. And it, this is, becomes a an, 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 an growing concept. Um, there are different influences. This can go back to the tinnitus detection again and place the, um, the amplifier bigger or um, beliefs and uh, safety behaviors can play a role on the um, perception of negative automatic thoughts. So this is a model that uh, we see a lot in patients um, and that is uh, wise to know something about and to, um, to have the possibility to talk, to communicate with them about this, um, especially if we did already some tissue work and still uh, these things are occurring in the background. I will come to that. I will come back to that a little bit later. So, back to some more practical work. If we do an examination of a patient uh, with tinnitus, our goal is to um, find structures that modulate the tinnitus of the patient. So, very wise is to ask your patient in a very clear room or a room without sound and noise 
Um, how uh, strong is your team that is now on a fast scale, for example? If they say it's a five or a seven, it's important that they uh, let you know if during the examination, the five goes up to an eight or goes down to, for example, a four or a three, because that's what you want to know. You want to, to, um, uh, to examine if you can influence the uh, loudness of the tone or the noise or the frequency. So it can also be that they say it's a uh, frequency in the middle and it goes up or it goes down. That's important to know. And we look, of course, as physiotherapists, special, especially, but also dentists for this, I think, to um, clear physical dysfunctions. So we start, of course, by a uh, subjective examination. Uh, we can ask specific questions like a teenager's uh, handicap inventory. I will not go through this too much now. This is an important um, guideline or um, questionnaire that you can use that divides into different uh, categories of um, tinnitus. Um, we go after the uh, subjective examination to a physical examination, where we can look to different things. And in Crafta, we find it very important to categorize these um, physical examinations in the craniomandibular region, the craniofacial region, the craniocervical region, and the cranioneural region. And why? Because if you categorize, categorize like this, um, you have more uh, possibilities to find the most um, uh, involved um, categorization or category in the, in the problems of this patient. And it gives you a better uh, schematic um, uh, possibility to go to treatment and to evaluate yourself afterwards. You can do specific tests in these patients, like a Weber or a ring test, where you uh, um, do an evaluation of the hearing perception. Um, you can do an equilibrium examination. Uh, you can look to, uh, for balance with a specific, very specific plate for that, or with the frenzel goggles to the uh, nystagmus, if it's occurring, yes or no. We can do a uh, nerve examination especially from the nerves that were mentioned before in the anatomy part that are related somehow with um, the uh, hearing um, uh, functions and we can do from these nerves uh, nerve conduction tests uh, so, so that we know how good the electrical information runs over the nerve uh, palpation of the nerve and uh, neurodynamics where you do like an upper limb neurodynamic test but now for the specific uh, cranial nerves if indicated. We can do some uh, measurements as a jaw examination. So we look to uh, side mobility, we look to uh, mouth opening uh, mobility, um, and we can do a jaw examination by passive or active tests. So we can ask the patient, of course, for active tests, but we can also do passive tests and make an evaluation of the possibilities of the jaw movements in this case provocation of irritation or pain, but also if we can influence the tinnitus, yes or no. We can do cranial um, uh, techniques. Uh, we can do measurements on the cranium to look for sym uh, symmetry on both sides, or passive tests where we put some force on the skull and see if it changes the perception of sound. And we can feel with specific parameters that we learn in Crafta um, if there is a change in um, um, mobility, in force, in strength of the skull in different directions. This is a patient, um, a woman with a right side tinnitus for um, four years ongoing. Uh, the tinnitus is normally, in average, seven out of ten. And um, she was in an ENT doctor's office and the examination was negative. There was nothing to find in the ear. She had an ear a test, a hearing test, and there was nothing special about that. And also the examination intra-oral uh, uh, was, um, was negative. Um, she has a lot of stress on the, on the job, on the, uh, on the work. And she had in the history uh, physiotherapy treatment of the neck for her tinnitus without any results until now. 
we did some uh, specific questions by this woman and she says uh, listen my tinnitus changes with neck movements and also when i have to chew on biting and um, i know that i grind during the night because my dentist tells me this and i wear splint for that and um, as a child i had a lot of otitis media so middle ear in inflammation and um, from 12 to 14 of age i had orthodontics because i had a too small uh, man, uh, maxilla the hearing aid um, with noise to uh, give an, um, a frequency against the tinnitus did not help she, she tried that for some weeks it was not helping and she recognized um, a morning stiffness on the right side in her cheek region the physical examination uh, also um, involves an uh, inspection of the mouth. Uh, we see an, uh, an um, occlusion that was not ideal with some open space here and with a lot of contact right in the front. But um, overall, it was um, uh, functional and stable. Um, when we look to the craniomandibular uh, region, the mouth opening was 41 millimeters with deflection to the right side oh, with deflection to the right side um, on palpation with the algometer she had an, uh, um, an, uh, tightness and pain on the uh, right temporal muscle and the masseter and if you look to the profile picture here you see also that there is a contraction in without any biting function in the masseter muscle um, and uh, she had a painful palpation uh, of the posterior digastric muscle, uh, which cause uh, it was very hypertonic and it causes an, an aggravation of a ten, a ten, a tinnitus. So palpation of the digastric muscle that we see here, this one is from the running from the hyoid bone all the way up to your uh, mastoid, uh, was causing an increase of her tinnitus and it was painful and um, hypertonic. This muscle is a uh, is nice small muscle, but surrounded by different nerves and um, can be very um, uh, provocative for different painful uh, regions or can uh, happen. We don't know if this was a neural irritation or that it was a uh, trigger point irritation from this muscle. Um, we did also accessory movements uh, of the jaw, where there was on the right side a stiffness in the temporal mandibular joint. And um, the accessory movements were stiff. The tests of the cranium, the occiput frontal test where with compression was um, stiff and gave a reduce of the tone. So there was less uh, volume of the tone and the C2 was stiff on the right rotation in the examination. Cranial neural was nothing specific happening in this woman. So clinical reasoning of this patient, um, there was a, a tinnitus on the right on one side with an on-off component on head and neck movements, but also on jaw movements. In a person, person with contributing factors, grinding, stress, um, but she had also clear physical dysfunctions. So the management was um, first explanation and education. So we learned her what this is. Um, if she had to be afraid of this, yes or no. If she was cleared up before. Um, we did um, techniques on the posterior digastric muscle. Um, I used the dry needling, but also stretch techniques. Uh, temporal mandibular joint uh, techniques on the right side to give more relaxation and mouth opening, more movement, coordination training of the chewing muscles with a uh, specific program to help the coordination there. We did the occiput and frontal bone technique and we used a uh, home exercise program, especially for the coordination of the jaw and also of the um, stretch of the digastric muscle. Results in this woman were, after six treatments, that she had an overall tinnitus of two out of ten. So there was a good situation. Her mouth opening was increased to 49 millimeters without deflection. 
the Mesito and Temple muscle had a different um, uh, uh, threshold of pain that was uh, better. The cranium and region, we had little pain on palpation of the posterior digastric, and it was not increasing the tinnitus. And the extracellular movements were better, but still a little bit restricted. Occiput frontal compression was um, soft, normal responding as in the other side, and not causing any change on the two out of 10 tinnitus experience. And the C2, and it was nice because we didn't treat the neck at all, but the C2 had no limitation on the right rotation. So in this case, it looked like uh, we had a um, good effect with um, the um, dysfunctions we treated and did our re-examination on. And um, the, the, the woman clearly um, increased in healthiness and had less problems. So going back to um, advice on treatment of tinnitus, um, if you look to the literature, they mention mainly the sound-based therapies like hearing aids and um, maskers, Mask um, yeah, um, hearing aids with a specific um, sound against your own frequency, tinnitus, and cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, there are an increase of uh, studies that see manual therapy interventions uh, connected with tinnitus and the effectiveness of this. And that is important because um, we see that the structures can be involved in, the, in these patient groups. So what can, an, um, uh, can you expect from a CRAFTA certified uh, physiotherapist? Um, this is in the, um, in, the, in the text on our website, in the uh, statement that we have on tinnitus. We want the craft therapist to act according to the tinnitus guidelines um, and integrate neurophysiological uh, cognitive affective models, uh, but also offers a systematic tinnitus education and adapts uh, on the lifestyle of the patient. Um, why? Because we don't think that only working on a muscle or only stretching um, a joint is enough in these uh, difficult patient groups. We think that it's important to um, uh, look to the uh, circumstances where this happened. Maybe this was a person that was grinding or um, uh, clenching from stress situations. Or is it a person that has a very bad um, posture habit? Or maybe it's a patient that has other illnesses or um, problems, maybe in the depression or in the psychological departments that cause uh, these irritations, and then only tissue-based therapy is may maybe not good enough. We want a uh, CRAFTA certified physiotherapist um, to work with tinnitus patients um, with a uh, strongly individual, individually based driven um, model uh, with clinical reasoning strategies in a biopsychosocial framework. So it has to be broad, not only directed to one specific joint or muscle but not a um, same therapy for everyone it has to be uh, to the person and fitting to this problem at this time it has to uh, be integrating uh, craniofacial mandibular cervical techniques with systematic training coaching and education without the education and without a good explanation to the patient it's enormously difficult to see changes and to get the patient with you with a good compliance to the therapy. We hope that the um, uh, therapy uh, therapist can work with a uh, con consensus with other healthcare professionals. And therefore, it's important to know the language and to know the treatment and the possibilities and the thinking way of uh, doctors, especially the ENT, the neurologist, speech therapists, and orthodontists. Um, if you combine in small circles around your clinic with these guys or girls, and you have a good correlation with them and you can see what happens there and add what you can do, then this could be a very strong um, multidisciplinary force that can help patients much better than in individual physiotherapists or individual dentists or individual ENT. So CRAFTA therapists will work in an anatomical and structural and neurophysiological uh, problem, but 
also with attention to the cognitive affective model that I showed you before. And why is this so important? Because good explanation and good um, education can maybe put um, a stop between the ne negative automatic thoughts and more arousal and distress, or between the um, tinnitus detection and the tinnitus related neural activity. If we learn patients that they um, can handle this and that it can change, and that it's not a, um, necessarily a specific danger situation, then we can um, maybe add on different parts of the curve or the scene and put stops in between where we can uh, help the patient a lot to stop the development of an increase in uh, anxiety, tinnitus, and more anxiety. That is the fear avoidance model that SEMA at all in the um, publication I show you in a few slides um, used. And we know this one also, of course, from low back pain patients and other patients. If you have, in this case, a source of uh, tinnitus and tinnitus perception, a patient has the possibilities when it's good guided and good explained, explained to go to acceptance. Uh, of tinnitus as a benign signal that is there, but you can live with it. And um, to, to have an exposure to normal activities and to recover, maybe not to the full without any tone or sound, but a healthy life. Or the same patient, maybe not the same from character, can from here choose to go to the other side and have a catastrophic misinterpretation of sound. Uh, fear related tinnitus um, and heightened awareness and alarm situation with more irritation and a generally uh, developed disability with more sensitivity, social uh, withdrawal or distraction and, and that anxiety and depressed mood. So these extreme examples can play a role in patients and uh, it's wise to to see your patient going in one or the other direction and help them with this so we think this is important to know about and to see if you can uh, can use it in your therapy because teens is not easy and it's an um, extreme different group it's still very in, uh, interesting to work with other disciplines and i told you in the beginning that i'm also a part of the Tinnitus Academy, and um, it's fantastic to work around a difficult tinnitus patient with a neurologist, with an ENT, with a yoga um, professionalist, so that you or a psychologist, so that you as a team can uh, deliver the same message to the patient. Everyone does his own specific work, but together you uh, have the same language and the same uh, approach to the patient the patient feels like is guided in a good direction. And that's a uh, huge advantage if you can build a team like that. And I uh, would um, advise you if you want to work with these difficult patient groups to do so. This is the European uh, multidisciplinary guideline. It's so nice because it's multidisciplinary. So you see that uh, different backgrounds um, uh, came together and looked to the evidence and literature and, and built this very uh, nice guideline that you can download uh, um, on different websites. I would advise you to do that if you want to uh, read more about this. And um, this is the link here to the um, uh, Krafta statement on tinnitus that you can uh, read or download and uh, where you can see the background of what I told you in this uh, presentation where we can um, um, uh, read a little bit more and also all the references are there on the on the site. Um, so that's a, that's a possibility. It's an, uh, it's an extreme interesting uh, topic and um, of course you cannot help every of these difficult um, uh, patients, but there is a group that responds extreme good on um, an evaluation and if you find the right dysfunctions combined with the problem, um, they really can um, can even be tinnitus free if you help them a lot in the, in the right structures. And uh, we have some uh, nice examples in our Grofta group where um, 
tinnitus patients experienced a lot of um, um, health improvement by, uh, by group therapy. So we are um, in one hour, very nice, um, at the end of the presentation. Um, and uh, I imagine that you have some questions. So um, I'm gonna uh, leave this one. Uh, you can write me an email, of course, if you, if you want. If you keep it short and to the point, I will react uh, as soon as possible. You can follow Crafta on uh, Instagram um, and you can read a lot on our Crafta website that is uh, crafta.org. Um, how often do you see, this is the one is from Aline, and she asked me, how often do you see eustachic tube dysfunction as a comorbid presentation with tinnitus? Um, that is a um, uh, good question, I think. Um, the um, dysfunction of the eustachic tube is a um, diagnosis that the ENT doctor has to make. It's not for me to, to have this uh, diagnosis. But what is very regularly happen is that um, uh, after a cold or after an inflammation in this region, um, a doctor in Holland for, for, for sure tells the patient after examination that there is a um, contracted or an, um, a medial directed change of the tympanic membrane and that the um, uh, irritation or the dysfunction of the eustachia tube is uh, the cause for that. And mostly they say, you have to wait. You cannot do anything for this. Um, sometimes they advise to use a salt um, solution um, through the nose to use this for a couple of weeks and see if, you're, if you can uh, change the, the, the irritation. Um, but um, um, in Crafta, we, we look to this a little bit different. And we see sometimes children with special children with um, bad swallowing habits and different uh, difficulty with uh, good tongue functions, that function. And we can train them or learn them to do that in a very good manner uh, to see if that uh, can change uh, the function of the, of the mid-face region. These techniques you can also uh, sometimes try if you have the imagination or the, the uh, diagnosis by the ENT doctor. That, um, that the eustachic tube plays a role in, uh, in the problem. Then we have a question from uh, Julie, and she says, a list of certain medications that increase tinnitus. Main ones. Um, I don't know these names. There are um, different names for different medications over the world, and also different names for the same medications. Um, I don't know. There are for sure medications that um, can increase or influence tinnitus. Um, on the other hand, I don't know a lot of medications that um, help with tinnitus that, um, uh, that doctors prescribe. Um, in the Netherlands, it's um, sometimes the case that uh, an ENT doctor prescribes an um, antidepressant. To, uh, to give the patient, especially when they are very anxious about the tinnitus, a little bit mood change, a, bit, a little bit relaxation to, uh, to get rid of a uh, few problems. But I don't know um, any specific medication names that increase tinnitus. Then we have a question from uh, Nehama. She asked me, um, Michiel, uh, besides the gastric muscle, are there any other muscles that you find are rapidly helpful to treat. Yes, um, uh, of course I examined them first, but um, temporal, um, uh, the masseter muscle, the ptyroid medial or lateral muscle um, can play a role. Um, upper cervical muscles can involve, be involved. Uh, think about uh, the, um, the, the four deep uh, upper cervical neck muscles but also the more superficial neck muscle can play a role. Um, so these are the main muscles I would look for. Anterior digastric could also maybe be involved. And sometimes you see clear trigger points or dysfunctions in the upper um, part of the sternocleidomastoideus. Yeah. So these are the muscles that I look for uh, mainly. The muscles I used before, I talked before about in the um, 
uh, anatomic part of the middle ear, the stapedius and the uh, leva, tensor, leva, uh, tensor tympani, are muscles that we uh, cannot attach directly, but indirectly we can. If we use movement of the jaw, for example, we have indirect influence on them. And maybe you can sometimes use, uh, if indicated, neural techniques of the innervating nerves of these muscles. So then you do an indirect treatment. Stretching the digastric muscle, how exactly? Okay, that's difficult to do in, in a webinar, but you can do techniques with the highway bone to, the, to one side and the jaw anterior, or do the um, highway bone with local treatment on the digastric muscle at the same time. And so you can do a technique on the, on the muscle belly with a movement of the highway bone and the jaw at the same time in specific positions. You will learn in the Crafta um, course, or you can learn the nice dry kneeling technique by Jan Tomoholt of Myopain. I hope this answers that one. Then Julie asked me um, your opinion. Why more men than women with tinnitus? I don't know. This is um, this is literature. I don't know why. Um, I, can, I cannot answer that question. So sorry. Tifa asked me, did you see difference in flexibility of the tongue where the case you mentioned had decreased mobility on right temporomandibular joint? If you did notice, did the flexibility improve with your treatments? Flexibility of the tongue is something I only see when changes in this, when there is a um, motoric dysfunction or when there's scar tissue in the tongue. So um, I maybe said it wrong, but uh, when I did a uh, temporomandibular joint um, mobility training, I did not uh, specifically see a tongue dysfunction or a tongue influence. So maybe that was, an, um, maybe I mentioned that in the wrong way, but uh, when uh, when we see we see in craft therapy tongue problems uh, a lot, but most of the times it's an, or a tongue with a motor problem, for example, after uh, irritation on the hypoglossal nerve, or after radiation therapy or uh, scar tissue when there was an operation around or in the tongue, and we see uh, local flexibility problems of the tongue. You can use the tongue in another way. Very, very nice if you do coordination training of the craniomandibular area, because the tongue is so hugely represented on the homunculus. It's a very, very good structure to do exercises with. Uh, please describe your favorite lateral thyroid release technique. Okay. Um, it's my favorite, but not for the patient most of the time, because it can be a little bit painful. I like to work with a technique that we learn in Krafta, uh, where we first bring our finger very close to the condyle, and they are make a specific technique to lateral, and then make an angulation to dorsal. Then we bring the head lateral and dorsal to the in perspective to the sphenoid bone and have a stretch on the thyroid lateral muscle. But if this is um, something that's not easy to do, you have to learn that. Um, you can also work with a dry kneading technique, a deep dry kneading technique, if you use, uh, if you know how to work with that. Can you describe um, in more detail what coordination of chewing means? Okay. Um, chewing is an, um, uh, a function that uh, will be very normal in most uh, patients. Everyone will do it for, for himself or herself. Uh, without a conscious um, behavior, but you can train it. And um, uh, jaw movements and jaw coordination is a lot of times uh, changed after pain or dysfunctions. And this is something that you can change, for example, first isometric, and later on with uh, particular movements to open and close the mouth um, in a different um, order or in a specific um, movement pattern. And um, look, if you see a lot of combining movements in neck or in high right reaching um, or in lip activity, and you can train that to be as low and as normal and as relaxed as possible. And this can influence the movement of the jaw and uh, the contraction, um, uh, contraction, um, how do you say this? 
contraction um, volume of the muscles. So that can help the, the patients also. You can train that. Very nice to do. And um, if you learn how to do that, it's also good to give the patient home exercises for that. Would you use noise cancelling headsets in your explore, uh, exploration in case you can not provide a silent environment? Mm. Now I'm going to tell you something very private. I'm afraid of noise cancelling um, headsets because I bought one two years ago. I had a lot of flights for Krafta and, and after I used them and I had a cold and I don't know what is the cause, I have a small tinnitus myself. And um, I threw away, or I sold them very cheap, my noise cancelling headsets because um, I was afraid that it has an um, influence on it. But I didn't see any um, good, um, substantial evidence for that. So it's just an assumption for myself. But I'm afraid of noise cancelling headsets and I don't want to, to use them anymore. But these uh, small things are working great. Um, but um of course people are sometimes really afraid of um, um a, a totally si silent um, environment and um, uh, maybe they like a, a small sound in the background most of my patients like uh, the radio always on a little bit so they have a distraction would you be afraid of changing inner ear pressure on the eardrum um Miguel is this, and I know him. Hi, Miguel. Um, I don't know. Um, I would not be afraid, but but as as said before, I'm afraid of of. Um, I'm not happy with with um, using headsets and um, eardrums and and um, noise stimulation um, in, in my patient groups. It can uh, also put on the volume um, very strong. Thanks for your question, Miguel, and I hope to see you soon. Um, does patients with tinnitus have symptoms of vertigo, fatigo, and uh, what do you think about a specific exercise to uh, reposition the crystals in the inside of the ear? Okay, this is from um, his 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 Tina Petrova. Thank you for the question. Um, they can have. Uh, vertigo problems at the same time because um, I showed you the um, the anatomy picture where you see the nerve of the um, the hearing nerve and eh, the cochlear nerve very very close together with uh, for example the vestibular nerve so it's not easy to imagine that these are involved at the same time in some irritations or pathologies or problems so it's wise to examine Vertigo in your um, uh, tinnitus patient groups, and um, if you have to uh, do the reposition movement, um, that depends on your examination. If you find this BPPV, uh, this benign position position um, uh, vertigo, uh, very clear in your examination after, for example, the Dix Pike, you can use uh, techniques, of course. To, uh, to reposition that, but until now, that was not very helpful for the um, tinnitus patient, not on the tinnitus side of the problem, that is. Help this was an answer for you. Um, thank you also for watching Ingeborg, Ingeborg Hussen, nice that you were there. Um, Stuart Wilds asked me, would you also include uh, manipulations of the petrosal bone? Yes, very good, um, Stuart. We can of use, of course, uh, use the petrosal bone. Maybe um, manipulation is not the uh, high velocity technique, but you can do um, pressure techniques, a change of direction of force, and change the force in this part of the skull to see if you have influence on the um, on the tinnitus of the patient. Good question, and yes, it belongs to the Krafta um, uh, cranial techniques that we use. Uh, Ron van Heerde asked me what is an um, inflammatory process of the uh, vestibular uh, and cochlear nerve. Um, there can be a lot of different um, infections in the middle ear region or a little bit more medial that can cause an, uh, an, um, a swelling or an inflammation or an oedema in this region. Um, you can think about um, 
things like an, uh, we had a couple of months ago here where a farmer was fallen down um, in, an, um, in, an, in a well and he hit the floor of the well very hard with his um, uh, petrosal and occipital bone region. He had a fracture through the um, uh, temporal bone and um, in the clinic they recognized that he had a um, um, uh, strong oedema, traumatic oedema in both nerves and he had a full um, function loss of um, balance, equilibrium and also a poor hearing problem on the one side that develops later on in a tinnitus. So that could be an extreme example of a um, uh, problem around the vestibular cochlear nerve at the same time. If um, there are no other questions, we are um, going to end the webinar, I think. So thank you for joining. I hope um, everyone has a good evening, morning or afternoon, or uh, I saw interesting countries. More over, over 22 different countries. So in some of your countries, it will be uh, morning now. And uh, in my country, we have to go to sleep. Um, I uh, hope to join you soon again in an online version or maybe live if we uh, can do something. If you have questions, let us know. You have the access to our email address. You can ask over Jan Dommerholt. And um, as said before, the video will be online soon. So then you can uh, look back to that. I was very happy that uh, so many of you joined this presentation. And uh, good night for the ones that are going to sleep. Bye-bye.